Hello and welcome back. Today we want to talk about determinants. The idea is deceptively simple. I'm going to start with a matrix and I'm going to come up with a number associated to that matrix. That number is going to be called the determinant. Now, it's important to mention in right now from the beginning that the matrix should always be square if I'm going to take a determinant. Non-square matrices don't have determinants. I'm going to write det of A for the determinant. It should tell me something useful or important about A. You could always start with a matrix and come up with a number. You can take its upper left entry times 12 or some other thing you could do. But the determinant is going to tell us something important about A. We've seen determinants before for 2 by 2 matrices. The determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix A, B, C, D is A, D minus B, C. So that's fine. The key theorem and is that A is non-singular. Oh, well, we'll get there. The key theorem is that A is non-singular if and only if the determinant of A is non-zero. A is non-singular if and only if its determinant is non-zero. So we're going to define determinants by four key properties. The first property is that when I add a multiple of, say, row i to row j, the determinant does not change. The determinant remains the same when I, multiply, I add a multiple of row i to row j. Okay. Second property, whenever I interchange two rows, when I swap two rows, when I switch row one with row three, the determinant does change. What happens is that I change the sign of the determinant. If it was positive, I make it negative. If it was negative, I make it positive. I multiply by minus one when I change to interchange two rows. Third property, if I ever multiply any row by some scalar, multiplying a row by a scalar, for example, to clear some fractions, including zero. I can multiply any row by any scalar, and what happens to the determinant is I multiply the determinant by that scalar. Okay, multiplying a row by a scalar, including zero, multiplies the determinant by that number, by that scalar. And the fourth property is that if I wanted to take the determinant of an upper triangular matrix, that's like the U in the LU decomposition, the determinant of an upper triangular matrix is very easy to compute. That's the goal. The plan is, well, so the determinant of an upper triangular matrix is just the product of the diagonal entries, product of the diagonal entries. And that means that when we use row operations to reduce a matrix to upper triangular form, we will be able to get uh, the determinant easily. So the theorem here is fairly straightforward and we'll, we'll prove it. If I'm a regular matrix, so I have an LU decomposition, let's say A is LU, L is special lower triangular, U is upper triangular, then in order to get the determinant of A, all I do is take the determinant of u, and by property four, that's the diagonal, the product of diagonal entries of u, that's u11, one, one, u22 two, two, through unn. Now, a might not be regular, maybe it's just non-singular, meaning that it has a permuted LU decomposition. Let's say it takes some number of row interchanges, row swaps, in order to get your permuted LU decomposition. Let's say it takes k row swaps. Then the formula for the determinant of A is still pretty easy. So if you get to your permuted LU decomposition, PA equals LU, P is a permutation matrix, L is special lower triangular, U is upper triangular. P, this means we did K row swaps in order to get there. Then the determinant of A is just minus one raised to the K power times the determinant of U, U11, U22 through UNN. 
So it's almost like the regular case, just off by maybe a minus sign. And finally, A is a singular matrix if and only if it's deter the, the determinant of A is equal to zero. So now we see non-singular and singular really refer to two different cases and they're immediately distinguished by the determinant. Let's prove this. Let's start with the regular case because it's the easiest. In the regular case, I only need one kind of row operation because all of my pivots as I move down stay non-zero. I don't ever have to swap any rows. So those are row operations were of type one. That's adding a multiple of row i to row j. But by property one on the last slide, those row operations don't change the determinant. And so I can reduce my matrix, my starting matrix, to an upper triangular matrix, u, using only row operations which don't, don't change the determinant. And that is exactly, I mean, that is essentially the statement of the theorem that says that the determinant of A is the same as the determinant of U, and we're done. Now, in the non-singular case, well, it's really the same idea, but I might have to do some kind of row swaps. So I just have to keep track of how many row swaps I did, because each row swap is adding me a factor of negative 1. I'll just multiply minus 1 k different times if I needed k row swaps. So let's see an example. Start with this matrix. 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, minus 1, 0, 2, 1, 3, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Start doing row operations to reduce this to upper triangular form. So the row operations that you need to do to clear the first pivot, that's the upper left corner, the, the leading one up there, uh, are as follows, minus 2 times the first plus the second, and minus 2 times the first plus the third, and minus 1 times the first plus the fourth row. You can check for yourself that the matrix you get after you do those three row operations looks like this. Those row operations have the effect of clearing the first column below the leading one. So keep going. Now clear the column underneath the second pivot. That's the 2 in the 2-2 two, two position. So here you'll need minus 1 half and minus 1 half because those are both 1s underneath it. The matrix that you get at the end of that is 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 2, minus 3, minus 1, 0, 1, no, 0, 0, 5 halves, minus 3 halves. You can check that yourself. And 0, 0, 1 half, 1 half. We're almost done, so just keep going. We only have one more row operation to do. We should just take minus 1 fifth times the third row and add it to the fourth row. Notice that we haven't done any row swaps. We started with a regular matrix. And that's a good thing. No row swaps means the determinant of A is the determinant of the upper triangular matrix we end up with, because we only use row operations of type 1. The matrix you get at the very end, the upper triangular one, uh, is as follows. So all you have to do to get the determinant of it, which is the determinant of A, is multiply the diagonal entries. So that's that means the determinant of A is 1 times 2 times 5 halves times 4 fifths. Now the 2's cancel, the 5's cancel, so you get 4. And that's the determinant of this matrix. So let's do another example. This time we'll do an example of a matrix that is singular. So you should expect that the, that the determinant is 0. So let's start with the following matrix, uh, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 1, 1, 2, 5, 3, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 1. And we'll do row operations to this. So I'll need minus 2 times the first row plus the second row, and minus 2 times the first row plus the third row, and minus 1 times the first row plus the fourth row. So what matrix do I get out when I do those three row operations? I get 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 3, minus 1, 0, 5, 1, minus 2, 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0. This matrix has the same determinant as A. 
because I've only done row operations of type 1. So I keep going. Now I need a 5 times the second row plus the third row, and minus 1 times the second row plus the fourth row. The matrix I get at the end of that. Again, the first row and column are unchanged. I'm only working in a sub-matrix now. So 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 3, minus 1. Now that'll be 0, 0, minus 14, minus 7. And 0, 0, 2, 1. Keep going. Now you just need to multiply by minus 1 7th times the third row and add it to the fourth row. And you'll get an upper triangular matrix. But it perhaps won't be your favorite matrix. Because you'll see in the final row that you get a row of zeros. 0, 0, 0, 0. But that's an upper triangular matrix. There's no reason why it shouldn't. I mean, it's still upper triangular. It's just that it's got a 0 in one of the entries. So when I take the product of the diagonal entries, I get 0. And there we go. That's the determinant of this singular matrix. 0 times minus 1 times 14 times 0. So let's see another example. Let's start with this 3 by 3 matrix. And again, we're going to try to get it into uh, tri upper triangular form. That requires a row swap because the first pivot was 0. So I swap the first two rows. And keep in mind that the determinant will get an extra minus 1 as a result of that swap. So then uh, after I swap the two rows, this is the result. But that's upper triangular. We're done. So the determinant of that upper triangular matrix is a third times 1 times 3. That's 1. So the determinant of A is minus 1 times that. And so we end up with minus 1 for the determinant of A. Let's see another example. Suppose I start with the following matrix. That's kind of bad. It's got fractions in it. Nobody likes fractions, but it's a 0, a half, 4 fifths. 1, 0, 2 thirds, 0, 2, 3. So rather than do row operations with these horrible fractions, here's my plan. I'll just multiply the first row by 10. That's the least common denominator, the greatest common divisor of the least common multiple of 2 and 5. Uh, and multiply the second row by 3. What matrix do you get out? Uh, well, it's not so bad. It's now about integer entries, 0, 5, 8, 3, 0, 2, 0, 2, 3. And now I want to swap the first and second rows again, because I'm keeping in mind that I swapped that, so I get a minus 1 on the determinant. I get 3, 0, 2, 0, 5, 8, 0, 2, 3. I only need one more row operation to get to upper triangular form. So multiply by minus 2 fifths times the second row and add it to the third row. The resulting matrix is not bad. 3, 0, 2, 0, 5, 8, 0, 0, minus 1 fifth. Let's call that matrix U. So clearly the determinant of U is the, well, clearly, the determinant of U is the product of its diagonal entries. So that's 3 times 5 times minus a fifth. That's minus 3. So how can we use this to find the determinant of A? All right. Well, it just matters what we did to get to U from A. So minus 3, that's the determinant of U. And what did, the changes were, there was a row swap that gives you a minus 1. We multiplied one row by 3. We multiplied another row by 10. And those were the only row changing, uh, determinant changing operations that we did. So the minus 1 is the row swap. The 3 is that 3. The 10 is that 10. And now you can just solve for the ter determinant of A. You find out that the, ter de that the determinant of A is 1 tenth. And that's enough. That computes the determinant for you. So we're almost done. Let's look at a couple of important propositions that will enable us to prove useful things about determinants. The first proposition that you 
have probably seen before in a linear algebra class, is that the determinant of a product of two matrix matrices, say A and B, A and B are both square, so their product is square of the same size. The de determinant of AB is the determinant of A times the, term times the determinant of B. From there, you can prove that the determinant of AB, which is the determinant of A, determinant of B, I'm just rewriting that line, but you know that you can swap determinant of A times determinant of B for determinant of B times determinant of A. Those are both numbers, so it doesn't matter what order you multiply them in. And by the same property, that's determinant of BA. So A and B don't commute, but their determinants can't tell the difference between them. As a corollary, this tells you how to find the determinant of the inverse of a matrix if that matrix is non singular. Because A times A inverse is the identity. The determinant of that is the product of diagonal entries, which is 1. On the other hand, by the above proposition, that's the product determinant of A times determinant A inverse. And I can just divide by the determinant of A, which wasn't 0, or else I wouldn't have been able to have an inverse in the first place. So that tells you that the determinant of the inverse is the reciprocal of the determinant. One more proposition. When I take the transpose of a matrix, swapping rows for columns and columns for rows, nothing happens to the determinant. The determinant of the transpose is the determinant of A. And finally, I need a formula for later use. You will never actually compute a determinant with this formula because the number of permutations uh, is large. We computed it was n factorial. But if A is uh, AIJs, then here's a formula for the determinant. You add up overall permutations of the rows of A, sign of the permutation, we'll talk about that, A times, or A sub pi of 1, 1, times A sub pi of 2, 2, times, keep going, A sub pi of n, n. Add up overall permutations, those products, with those signs. Now, pi again, is a permutation of the rows of A. And if A has n rows, then there are n factorial such permutations. n factorial grows very quickly with n, so your summation is going to swiftly grow out of hand. Let P be the permutation matrix that's associated with that permutation. It just means do that permutation to the rows of the identity matrix. That's P. So then the sign of pi is just the determinant of this p. It's just minus 1 raised to the number of times you had to swap rows uh, in the identity matrix to get p. So it's just minus 1 to the number of row swaps in the permutation. So let's finish off the video with just one more example. Suppose I start with this matrix A. Let's call it A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I where A through I are just some fixed yet unknown scalars. And suppose I know, magically, that the determinant of A is equal to 12. All right, let B be this matrix. 2D, 2G, 2A, E, H, B, 3E plus F, 3H plus I, 3B plus C. And the question is, what's the determinant of B? Can I somehow start from the determinant of A and get to the determinant of B? And I figured this back out. And the answer is yes. Yes, I can. And the first thing to notice is that the first row of B has these twos multiplying it. So the determinant of B must be two times the determinant of the matrix that I would have started with uh, and multiply the, the row by two. So that's a D. G, A, E, H, B, 3E plus F, 3H plus I, 3B plus C. Again, all that I've done is realize that B is the matrix that you get from multiplying the first row of some other matrix by 2. And so the determinant of B is 2 times the determinant of that matrix. I just wrote down what it was. But the next thing to notice is that this matrix, which is simpler and looks more like A, uh, it looks like I've done some kind of row operation. It looks like I've multiplied the first, sorry, multiplied three times the second row uh, and added it to the third row in some nice, nicer matrix. Uh, what matrix? Well, it looks like I've 
taken this matrix, D, G, A, E, H, B, F, I, C, and done the following row operation to it. It looks like I've just taken minus 3 times the second row and added it to the third row, and that's how I got the matrix that's on the left. This is this matrix, which means that the determinant is the same because that's just a row operation of the first kind, the first type, type 1, and that doesn't change the determinant. Now this matrix looks a lot more promising. It looks almost like A, but something's strange about it. If you look, the first column of this matrix is the second row, and the second column is the third row, and the first, uh, the third column is the, is the first row. So columns have been swapped with rows, which means I should probably take the transpose, but what happens when you to the determinant when you take the transpose of a matrix? Well, if you looked on the previous slide, the answer is nothing happens to the determinant when I change uh, rows for columns when I take the transpose of a matrix. So the determinant of this matrix here is the same as the determinant of its transpose, and its transpose is D, E, F, G, H, I, A, B, C, which looks a lot like A, except something is still wrong. You can see that the first row should be swapped with the third row, because that'll put an A, B, C into the first row. Uh, what happens to the determinant when I swap two rows? Well, I get a minus sign. So I get minus 2 times the determinant of the swap. The swap now looks like A, B, C, G, H, I, D, E, F which is almost A. We're just one row swap away. If you now swap the second and third rows, you'll get, well, another minus sign into the determinant, but that gives us 2 times the determinant of, swap those rows, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And that's the determinant of A. So I have 2 times the determinant of A, but the determinant of A was 12, so this is 2 times 12, and that's 24. And that tells you that the determinant of B, whatever it was, must be 24. And that's a wrap. I will see you in class.